Okay, so I start again? Yeah, I told you I was in a very serious motorcycle accident that could have killed me, but my ankle took the beating, but the ankle was smashed. When I asked the doctor what it looked like, he said, when he opened it up, it looked like a bag of broken peanut shells. That's how bad it was. It was smashed and dislocated. So I wrote a poem, and then that doctor, for some terrible reason, committed suicide, and I wrote a poem in tribute to him on that day. But I'm going to read the operation report. I've read this at different poetry, and it cracks people up on how difficult it was to put this ankle together, and what a miracle it is that I can walk. It's a holy miracle. So I'll start with that. So this is the operation report, dictated by Cameron Hall, 10, October 6, 1962. Okay, what I had was a severe fracture dislocation of the tibial fibula astrologic, excuse me, astrologar calcaneus navicular cuboid cuneiform joints right massive. Same. Open reduction and internal, internal fixation of the above fracture dislocations procedure. The right lower extremity was thoroughly prepared and draped so as to lie free on the table. A previous attempt was closed manipulation and reduction of this severe fracture dislocation was attempted on the local anesthesia because of his head and abdominal condition. This was unsuccessful. After complete anesthesia and preparation of the extremity, an attempt was made to manipulate this by closed methods. This was unsuccessful. And the lateral displacement of the tarsal elements below the protruding, protruding talus was unchanged. A Kirshner wire was passed transversely through the calcaneus and transversely across the met, metar, metar so cuneiform joints using strong traction and counter-traction in order to distract the fracture dislocation. An attempt was made at reduction without success. A linear longitudinal incision running across the distal portion of the tibia and ankle joint and latitudinally along the displaced cat talus was made. The head of the talus was found to lie immediately beneath the skin surface, having completely perforated the capsular structures as well as the subcutaneous tissue. Inspection of the area after opening revealed that the talus was attached to its soft tissue structures only by the posterior tibial alta calcanea ligaments. There was complete rupture of the lateral as well as the talocanaal liniments inferiorly. There was complete luxation of the ankle, although the tibial fibular relationship appeared to be intact. The navicular was displaced plantward and relationships appeared to be intact. The navicular was displaced plantward and lateralward. The anterior tibial tendon was interspersed between the head of the talus and the navicular. This was the ultimate key in the reduction and prevented, and, and prevented talus and the navicular. This was the ultimate key in the reduction and prevented any closed correction. It was apparent that severely communit, commu, com, Kami muted fractures were present in the cuneiform, but it was not until full appreciation of the massive explosed fracture of the cuboid was obtained that the key to this reduction was found. The navicular was quite easily reduced on the talus, but complete instability was present. With considerable difficulty, a cursional wire was passed from the tibia into the superior tailor surface, maintaining the ankle reduction. The foot was then reduced and a cursional wire was introduced through the navicular into the head of the talus, maintaining this reduction. To this stage of, in the procedure, it had been formed under a tourniquet. This was then released and copious bleeding was noted from all areas, but the procedure was finished without the use of the tourniquet. The 
The capsular structures were, were then reapproximated using zero chronic and the sub Containous tissue was zero zero zero. The skin was closed with a con closed with a continuous zero zero dermal line with some difficulty because of the massive swelling of the foot. Scarlet red gauze was applied ab about this incision as well as across the abrasion present on the leg. A massive compression dressing was applied from the tips to the toes to the distal thigh area, and a long cast was applied. Circulation was excellent to the toes at the finish of this procedure. The patient was returned to the recovery room in good condition. Sign, Cameron Hall, MD. So that was quite a difficult, miraculous operation. And that wonderful doctor for unknown unknown reasons committed suicide. This is my tribute to him. I wrote it on the same day I learned that he did that. I was so stricken because he was such a wonderful man. A tribute to a man. With the wind blows the trees, leaves. With sky comes clouds. With generosity come wisdom. Thus you came, you, my Dr. Hall. Thus came you with the wind and sky and flower and a good taste of hell, I am sure. As I write to you, a certain sense of peace comes to me. As I sit upon a bridge, I am in Topanga Canyon. The sun is warm, it feels good. And when the sound of cars cease in that once in a while, then so ceases time. So beginneth peace. If you taught me anything, and you taught me many, many things, then you taught me the essence of what a doctor could be. Skilled hands, yes. Certain fingers, yes. Steady eyes, yes. With these you take fragments of bone into the vehicle of foot. Yes, you were an amazingly skilled, a craftsman of bone and flesh. But there are probably many such mechanics and human beings have a few needs that differ slightly from machines. So ultimately, it is his humanity that makes the doctor beneficent and a saint. It was here in humanity, in humankind, that you lived. It was here that you were a poet, a true poet, a true doctor, because you cared about people, not alone bones. Yes, you cared about people. And thus you had no patience. You had compañeros, compañeras, sisters, brothers, children who never once felt separate from you. No, never separate or different, but the same wind, the same tree, the same sun, the same sky. And I would have stayed 10 years instead of 14 months on those crutches if you had said it to me. And never would I have put weight on that foot that looked like, quote, a bag of broken peanut shells when you looked inside it. When the cast was all red in color instead of white and I was frightened and you told me, quote, it's the blood from the incision. It will be like that for a few more days. And I felt good. I trusted. I never had one moment of fear for you love people. And with this gift of giving, you could not help but to give infinite trust. Now they tell me you are gone, gone to earth and sky by your own hand. But once again, though I grieve, though I sad, though I tear in the inside, ultimately I trust, ultimately I feel happy, ultimately I give love. Ultimately, I feel new strength, new courage, entrenched further. Now my purpose, for you love people, and your gift does not cease with your death. Nay, it increases, bringing high, clear, and to the center, I. To the heart comes dance, comes song, comes finally the gift of generosity, comes compassion, the planting, the spreading of the seed, humankind, the entrenched further new 
now courage to make this earth a better place. That was my tribute to the most wonderful doctor that I ever had in my life. Now a whole different kind of poem. Um, you know, we're in a war in Iraq, as, as everybody knows. A war I, I oppose because I've been to Iraq, and Iraq was a wonderful country. Even with Saddam, it was a wonderful country, and, and we've devastated it, and we've killed it. And there's this whole notion of suicide bombers, suicide bombers. They condemn suicide bombers, but I don't condemn them. This is a tribute to suicide bombers. We, who are massively bombing airplanes, who drop deadly bombs on whoever we wish to annihilate into millions of shards of dead, striated flesh, we, who have the most modern of tanks using depleted uranium shells that have caused cancer, deformed, grotesque babies born of infected mothers whose tank shells are the most modern, the most deadly, wreaking out death and destruction. We, who have deadly attacked helicopters that spew machine gun bullets at such a devastating rate whose guns slaughter the helpless human beings beneath them. We who have modern Humvees that have armor plate when our fascist president supplies them with it, who fly across the land loaded with soldiers with the most modern slaughtering weapons. We who have massive ant aircraft carriers and battleships who with absolute impunity launch airplanes and guided missiles that slaughter both civilians and soldiers with absolute impunity. Total safety from any danger because the Iraqis have no air force. 25,000 dead since we slaughtered their country and our losses of 1,700. 25,000 devastated mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, and they, what do they have to fight against the total masses of armaments that terrorize their lives, that terrorize them into the oblivion of death? They only have one way to fight back, which is to give up their lives, bombs strapped to their bo human bodies. Every time one of these human beings does this, he or she dies. And we who have caused the terrorizing masses of death are terrorists of the first class. We who hear this, who has ever stood neath our bombs, our rapid fire machine guns, their slain bullets, our massive guided missiles, they have only one singular way to fight. Back their lives, their human hearts, blown to smithereens as they give up their lives to kill us. They are not the terrorists. They are responding to the terrorism of our awesome armaments of death, our overwhelming, obliterating terrorism of weaponry that invaded their country and turned it into a fetid, rotten cesspool of murder, rape, and fear, terrorizing the entire population to even walk the streets of their country. So don't throw bricks from a glass house. We are the terrorists. They are the human beings losing their lives in their human attempt to fight back against the massive, overwhelming, of our terrorist military may long live their brave attempt to resist our terrorism. That's the poem, and that's how I feel about it. Okay. Well, I, 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 got, a, I got a page here of a poem that I don't understand what happened here. Um, that was... Uh, one of, this poem is one, one of the most popular poems 
This poem is hung on tons of walls. It's, it's all over the place. It was written to Jim Morrison's first love, Mary Frances Werbelow, when I had a fight with her and I had to reach into my soul to become selfless. You know, so that there would be no, no ego at all. It's called compassion. Compassion for Mary Frances Werbelow. Compassion is endless, saith the Buddha. But I, who worship this idea, this feel, this truth, I fall short when the instinct inside my heart becomes wounded and I want to lash out in anger for self-preservation. Thank life for the simple sweet time that if I pause and let the wounds sift and find their own resolution, then the music becomes sweet inside my soul, no longer sad, and my heart opens to understand the other person and to realize inside my heart that they are in pain, that some kind of knife is twisting its blade inside their bones, and the poison has spread through the soul to dictate, to control, as pain is capable of doing so swiftly, as the wound causes the explosion, and we lash out like a tiger, snarling, frosting through the nose and heart, the foam of pain. We be here only a short time. We are not mountains, not stone nor earth. We are heart, and heartbeat is finite, shorter than the broad rivers, not less, but shorter. And for this, we must learn to reach out before it is too late, and death captures, and will not ever let go. Still, it is not too late to reach out harder, and filled with the threat of guilt, it is living acts of give of the endless compassion of the Buddha that release us into the feel of giving life, that cleanse us out of the fear, the convoluted fear that the pain owns you. It is real, but it is illusion. It must be entered naked and unafraid, wide open and tender. The language of simple heart, the trust in goodness, the feel of life's touch, the healing flower of contact between human beings, the embrace of clean hearts open and trusting, no taking, no giving, but meeting, joining without ask or command, being at one with the moving into the light. Compassion is endless, saith the Buddha. Okay, now I'm going to read a poem that everybody, it's been translated into many languages. People seem to love it and, um, I have this thing with ants. Um, ants show up at unexpected times when I'm writing a poem. They'll crawl over the poem. They come to me in my bed. Ants and me just have a, a thing going with each other. So here's a poem uh, that I wrote in San Francisco in, in 1974. Poem. I take out the garbage. Once an easy act. No longer an easy act. Ants live in the garbage. It provides their food. Ants need the garbage. Ants are my brothers. I don't want to kill them. I don't want anything to be killed out of lays or fear or habit. Last week, I ate a steak. I didn't care anymore. I was crazy. I needed something heavy to earth me. I smothered the steak with butter fried onions. It weighed over one pound. I ate it as if I were a machine. I ate it out of habit. I finished it as easily as you could eat a slice of soft bread. Faster than that, the taste was mechanical. Ants are my brothers. Hundreds of them in the garbage, eating the remaining blood of my sirloin steak, soaked into the supermarket package. More ants than I had seen in a year in the kitchen, suddenly needing meat blood, congested streams of my brothers all in the garbage. I become frightened. There are too many of you. I must take out the garbage. No longer an easy act. I remove the inner bag. I place it gently into the large garbage pail outside. I leave the top off so they may exit. I place the plastic plastic pail on the lawn so the remaining ones may make way back to earth. I am conscious that I have misplaced entire families, uprooted homes, split up marriages, separated mothers from daughters and sons. I stop thinking about it. I don't know 
I don't understand how they live anywhere. I do not comprehend how they know where they are, how they can be transported vast distances with no warning and still always continue to live. And still they somehow remain my friend, live in my room, stray into my bed a couple at a time or a solitary voyage. Today again I must take out the garbage, once an easy act, but no longer an easy act. For life, life has become my brother. I cannot kill my brother life so easily any longer. I don't want anything killed out of lays or fear or habit. Life is precious beauty. Life be gone, belongs only to life. Life is no one's private property. Houses are built one stone, one brick at a time. But first comes the first brick. Always must come the first brick first. Once easy act, no longer easy hacks. This I love. This is good. This is the life, the life, the life. And I continue with the wrestle for its true form. Continue to wrestle for its truest form. Okay. Um, I just finished uh, a long fast. Fasting is a, is, a, is a major figment of my life. And um, I, I really worship fasting. And so... Um, this is a poem I wrote about fasting, and uh, it's a poem that every time I've read it, um, people have really enjoyed it. So um, here it is. It's called Total Fasting. It is soft in here like birds this morning of day seven of fasting with no food or water, soft, gentle, patient, loving, Every piece of life the eye sees. The photos, posters, the paintings on my bathroom walls become gently alive, entering my heart with their significance. The essence of why life is alive. Its essence becomes a clear, quiet bird at rest neath the rising sheen of the sun. As the light begins its ascent on my earth's skin, her rapture at sun's life, the warm tongue of sun's heat, the gentle fire, its caress begins, its walk all over this planet, and the tendrils of what it does touches inside my soul and heart. The gentle hypnotic raga, the bamboo flute, the simple soar of life glowing outside becomes inside until there no longer exists separation. The hot, succulent water beating down on my skin is my skin. My skin is the water's heat. Its structure becomes my heart in the entrance song of the birth of acute consciousness of what life in is in its reach and how it moves at the begins of time's dawn into the next phase of the rising morning heart. Its sweet light shining soft, gentle, brightly into this room becomes inside my soul in an entrance song of touch. The eyes and spirits of all my friends who have shared the light with me begin swimming round my soul, becoming one with each beat of my heart. Their beings become my blood walk inside the great cavern, the unending skies of the life kiss, why birth anointed us in the first moments of our times here, becomes a song flowing like a resplendent river in early morning mountain sunlight. The pristine glory of earth and sun are born now in every beat of the heart. Each small, simple flow of the blood becomes of earth sunlight as the heart covers the room, in s inhaling spirit voices inherent in all things, alive inside all the memories. These seeds of Vita begin glowing like pearls shining like stars, swimming like dolphins and salmon, 
Our souls splash with light and waters, anoint the dawn with kiss, and embracing the earth that become us, we advance into the tides like a spider weaving web into the dawn's pristine light. We weave our lives into the dance's mystery, softly, slowly, patiently. We begin to see everything's life glow, everything's honor song becomes crystal clear, glowing as the immense living chain of praise songs emit their tenderness out from the heart of the deep soul, where the history is kept and nourished by our life awarenesses, how they grow in tolerance and comprehension of where the life glow touches and gives us our significance, a particular place in the vast cosmos, become the tendrils of this great unending river of time and space that we swim in. For our breath becomes our breath, becomes our eyes, that sense the presence of sun's sweet rise. As our lives grow into the flowers, that our human heartbeat was born for. We become this primal light that will flow past where time will go, will live before time or distance was born. We swim inside the primal soup of life, its essence broth simmering quietly, gently in the spirit eyes of our souls brought wide open on this soft morning of eternity where it is all like birds. Okay, when I got to Yugoslavia, I hitchhiked to Yugoslavia from Switzerland, and um, I got, you know, I bought some yogurt, and I was going to go to sleep in my tent, and I just thought of this poem, and um, I wrote it in Yugoslavia, right across the border. In the afternoon of the fawn, I will always be a child before the moon. In wings of white fire, I smile. This is what there is to do. This is a garland of flowers who circle your breath as stars circle my earth, my earth who loves me with simple moments of silence, who are always my friend. As I walk you, Yugoslavia, as I friend your simple and good people, my heart and apple split in half, the seeds me spilling through the need gold like the sun, that human heart has to touch skin of ways to be at one with another human being's heart. This is the only art we seek. And um, this is another poem um, that um, I wrote in, well, this is another poem that I wrote in Yugoslavia. This is a special day. Because this day was at Kragojevac, and the Nazis killed every man and boy. They slaughtered 10,000 Yugoslavians in one day, because the Yugoslavian partisans were killing Nazis. So I was there on a celebration day, and I saw at the end of the ceremony, it was on a hillside, there were levels of people that were, 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 were saying things that were part of the program. And the woman, it was pouring rain. The rain was the worst rain you'd ever been in. It was just pouring down rain. She took down her umbrella and started to walk up towards the, the performers. And a soldier gently stopped her and brought her back. But then she did it again, and he knew better than even touch her. And she walked up next to the, the, the performers and stood right with them. And um, right behind it is a V-shaped monument with just hands and faces, that's it, because that represents all the people that were slaughtered. So I definitely wrote a poem about that woman and what happened that day. It was, it, it cut me like a knife. Poem for Kragojevac, October 21st, 1986. 
dedicated to the future children of Yugoslavia. Never will I forget the face of the woman at Kragoyevac, who, feeling the explosion of blood become love of her people, living explosion of life, bursting her heart into 1,000 pieces of skin, who became her legs, 1,000 more became faces, the next became hands, eyes, breasts, all of them became such a force that she moved ahead up the earth, approaching human beings made of singing blood, faces married into living stone, birds flying to sun, children at their mother's breast. She was, she is every last one of us, every first one of us at the edge, and no one dare call us nor her crazy, because life is like this, life is truth, her body, her soul, propelled, commanded by the earth to advance into the heartland of her people's blood. So she went, taking down her, umbletter, her umbrella, letting the bleeding rain pour down on her beneficent head, the blood of stars, of children's faces, of distended hands, joined then of the moment of her march, a long, terrible journey of beauty into one hand, giant and reaching of a people born of the sun, of joy of the earth and its pain and its beauty of birth. And all of us across the face of this globe became her eyes, her legs, the muscles of her stomach, her thighs, the pregnant burning in her heart, the voice in her breast screaming into her blood, the song of freedom, our song. We all went into her legs, we all went with her, desperate and beautiful, hungry in truth. We sang with her the anthem of life and our sound burned its face into the sun, and all was light. Yeah, that was quite an experience, and, um, and she was an amazing woman. Um, you know, I, I love flowers, and I love roses, and when I used to live in Sacramento, there were roses. I had peach roses, lavender roses, and white roses. And um, they saved my life when I was depressed and fucked up. And this is a poem that people really love. And I, I, I have amazing pictures of roses that you haven't seen, but, but I have um, awesome pictures of roses. So here come the three roses, the hot sun kissing, direct on its lips, the beauteous peach, open wonder, the lavender beauty in shade, now not fully open, reeking with fragrance, the tall, astronomically high, touching the very heavens, white beauty, still in bud, about to open into splendor. Three roses and a human being that worships them, who has written and photographed their magnificence, for they have given him reason to live when he had none. And they have sung with him when his life was a flying symphony of leap. And now this crazy man has not watered them except twice this entire summer, sunk in mental depression, all my norms disoriented into the pit of death or love. Yet they bloom, their bushes totally healthy, green their stalks, strong, straight, high. I wonder about my, my, the, the mysteries of this earth that continue to anoint us, even in spite of ourselves, that pick us up out of our death and wash us clean. Three roses, three rose bushes that have saved my life. Long live your plumage. May the sun kiss your eyes, your breasts, until they flame with the life that you give my soul. May earth know your roots as the living loam of your wonder cascades through my soul. Your indestruct indestructible spirit and beauty, your tenacity as you marry time with your grandeur.
That's a, my poem about my roses. Um, now I'd like to read a poem um, that was written in Iraq. Um, I was invited to Iraq by a wonderful poet of Iraq. Uh, uh, his name was, was um, oh boy, Abdul Arazak Abdul al-Wahid. I met him innocently and he invited me to his country. To a, I, was in, I was there three years in a row, 86, 87, 8, in this massive international festival. And I was taken all over Iraq and it was, it was a, it's, a, it's a wonderful country and we should never have invaded it. So this is a poem. When, when I did this poem originally, there was a statue of their greatest poet. I think I showed you the... It, it, uh, I have the... Wait a minute. Let me, let me find it. Um, it's, this is okay. I have Oh, okay, you have it. Okay, there's a statue of Al Sayyab, and um, I didn't. I was there just photographing a Mauritanian poet who, who was reading his poems from the statue, and and I wasn't I wasn't looking to to read any poem. But an Iraqi said, "Do you want to read a poem?" I said, "No. I mean, that's the Tigris Euphrates right behind the statue. That's Al Sayyab. It'll be English." He didn't even want to hear that. He said, "Do you want to read a poem, Mr. Max? Do you want?" I said, okay, and he boosted me up, and I stared into the sun because I knew they wouldn't understand English. So I figured if I was staring into the sun, they would trust me, and that would convince them that, that my spirit was, was, was at one with the earth. So a poem dedicated to the sun, which I stared directly into while improvising the original poem, and to the Iraqi poet Abdul Arazak Abdul Wahid, who out of the innocence of his heart invited my innocent heart unto his beloved Iraq. Once during the Iran-Iraq war in Basra, Iraq, in front of the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the Shat al-Arab, one of the cradles of all civilizations, in bright sun afternoon, in front of the statue of their most beloved poet, Bader Shakar al Sayyab, after I had photographed a fierce Mauritanian poet reading from his perch at the base of the statue. An Arabic man who knew my poetry somehow, perhaps probably in Iraq, he said, Mr. Max, do you wish to do a poem? I said, Me? That's al Sayyab. That's the Tigris Euphrates rivers, and it would be in English. He acted as if I had not even spoken, as if he were deaf to all my words except the heart and heartland of where poetry itself is birthed, the boiling blood of the truth that life speaks into you like a blowtorch. And he said emphatically, Mr. Max, do you wish to do a poem? And I had no choice because of the purity of his offering from the volcano of his pure heart, I said yes. And he cupped, he instantly, he cupped his hands and I put my left boot into them. And he boosted me onto the base of the statue, a wondrous poet of heart, the naked being of Badar al-Sayyab. I stared directly into the afternoon sun. Just like this afternoon sun, where I sit on a beneficent tree stump in my backyard with the high holy sun kissing my soul, I stared directly into that afternoon sun and began improvising a poem about war, peace, touch, pain, death, life, birth. It had to honor all sources. And because the poet who happened to be me, it could have been you knew that 95 to 99 percent of the human beings in front of him would not, could not understand his English words, his English language. You stare into the sun directly. This they can understand. This is the universal language of poetry, the human soul naked to the light. And you say from the fuming spirit of you the song of innocence of humanity to get them through the horrors of their war, one million dead before it ends. You spin the fountain of life from the deep mountain of the universality of our human blood. You feel the rivers behind you pulsing your blood, shepherding your heart. 
You feel the great poet above you kissing your soul. You feel the beautiful rays of the sun marrying your eyes. You let the volcano of your trust erupt into the music of life. It's birth song, and you do this with all the heart and trust given you. And when the spear, the symphony of life, living spear ends, when your words complete their sonata, coming home to peace and birth, when finally the rivers are calm and the applause erupt, you don't feel them. You hear the cacophony of hands clapping, but you know it was the sun the rivers, the poets speaking through you like a child's eye. And when the Lebanese woman weeping from your poem who understood your English language embraces you, her salt tears kissing your soul because she must return to war ravaged Beirut, a country in flames of infamy. You hug her knowing why you broke her heart wide open, taking full responsibility for your words. You beseech the Iraqi, the Iraqi officials for the right to accompany all the Lebanese poets to the airport the next day because you owe them this respect. And we who have never experienced our country bombed, torn apart in war, truncated and obliterated completely into the arms of death, we must know that our hearts are at one with those angels who are slaughtered. So at the airport, you hug and kiss every Lebanese poet departing on that silver bird. And as you ride alone home in the car from the airport, the bells of infamy and peace ring together inside your soul in the crystal silence of truth. This is one of the places that poetry is born. One of the moments when to be poet is the universe. The healing force of the crystal light is the marriage, the mate of the high holy sun, speaking, breathing together in the blood streak of peace. That was a poem written in Iraq. And um, now I'd like to read a poem written in Haiti. I spent a month in Haiti. And this was a very, um, well, this was a powerful night in a cafe. I wasn't expecting this. It caught me by totally surprise. It, it was just uh, it was just a real ugly, terrible scene, and um, this is what happened. It's a poem for Jean Maurice. Jean Maurice was a French Canadian scholar who um, I had been with in Jacques Mel, and, and when his suitcase was laying down, we weren't looking. A kid stole his suitcase, and his, his manuscript was in it, and he was devastated. He was devastated. So I wrote a poem. This is a poem for him because. We were together at this cafe when all this happened. Out in the moonlit night, our poet's heart adventures. The lands we voyages, the rivers who next nested us. Life is always chance. We were together at the same table with Elsie when he pronounced, the white man owns the world. He in his Haiti, he a world renowned artist, He's sick with hate, with defeat, turned inside a poison dagger, a poison contaminating his blood. Screamed, he did, from the deepest cave of his chest. He leaked out sound that shattered the civilized night at the cafe. Oh, 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 his, one, his soul screamed. His woman, beautiful of the, as the sun, resplendent as a virgin flower, naked and nascent, dawn's free kiss. His woman lit many matches on some, direct in front of my eyes, centimeters from my screaming heart. She let the matches burn down to sear her fingers. 
She did not move one lifetime back from the flame. She let it sear her soul. There was no stench of burnt flesh. There was no mark. This is how naked, how on fire the Haitian night was. He, wild, crazed prisoner of a racist earth, a world against the sun, he turning as Fanon had so clearly dictated centuries ago, he turning his kill of pain against those close to him, the black Haitian matriarch wife of the white French owner of the bistro, he pummels the mother, pummels the mother in his birth, hissing, bellying, bellowing at her, traitor, I am a Haitian. He screamed. She, the other, has explained to me that Haiti and the French, the colonizer, the murderer, the alien French, Haiti means to hate oneself, but Aiti, Aiti in the Indian, who a massacre, genocide, Aiti means rising mountain. Oh, if only one poet had been present to scream into this tortured artist's soul the words of the Pestre, Jacques Romain, César, in his Creole, or sad to say, perhaps in the sick French, it would have thwarted the poison dance with his blood. The words would wed. No, there was only silence. There was even Makut. Terror was grinning his hideous face. And when the violence exploded, his woman protected him, put her body, her life between him and the killer. Oh, Haiti, may peace reign supreme. Oh, Haiti, your thundering energy, your turbulent masses of fever, blood, the final end of Makut, the sunfire annihilation of the past tyranny. Oh, Haiti, his woman weak, she scrawled, she sobbed, she screamed, but she stood. She never waited, wavered. The old man, his friend, his World War II or Korea friend, his pilot, his friend, breathing the danger breath of two alien words. He, at the end, wept profusely. Jean Maurice, this is what you, I, Elsie, war against. This is what the thief who wounded you and Jacques Mel was poisoned with. Poverty, hopelessness, a dead end of death and life, a way without remorse it would seem. Yet we who kiss the dawn with wet eyes, we know better. This is the first poem I have written in your Aiti, your Brazil, your river, your world. As travel we must, the very veins of our earth, me paralyzed totally by the mass of hunger, the mass of energy, a giant, giant, throbbing heart, a volcano, erupting, screaming stomachs, hands, naked fingers, their eyes paralyzing my heart. As I trusted Joseph to lead me to protect my soul, my body, this is a rising sun who kisses you. This is a people struggling for centuries to breathe. In the car you drove it so slow, you could not leave Jock Mel. My heart, my arms cradled your scream. The silence of a heart that will not beat, suspended in terror. The mountains bereft of trees, raped of their fingers. We pass, yet they live, they live. The mountains must be replanted. As you, my friend, will replant your, replant your song. All peoples meet for a reason. All peoples are the destiny of our planet. In this Haiti, where we met in this night of moon, it is a blackout. The electricity just went. The generator is silent. It is my final night here in Petronville. Yet human voices of belief surround my ears. Life lives life, live, loud and clear. The moon is bright tonight. The air sensual. The rising sun coming. The light has returned. Well, that was a poem written in Haiti, and that was a powerful experience. Um, I'll read a poem. When I was about to go to Iraq, um, 
I was very happy because I was finally going to go to the Middle East, but I was in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. And this poem has been translated into many languages, and I read it once, and I was in Nineveh. And um, I had this poem translated into Arabic by a great Arabic poet. And, but the, the guy outside that was in charge of the reading, he went over this poem for two hours in Arabic and made every... He spent two hours making correction and making it crystal perfect. And when it was read, a bunch of Arabic poets came to me after reading because most of the poems were, in, you know, it was the Iraq-Iran War and they were reading poems. Saddamo, Saddamo, we're going to win the war. And they were all war poems. But this was a poem about peace. And about four or five guys, Arabic, they said, oh, I was so happy you read that poem. It was so beautiful. We heard so much about war. We needed, we needed something like this for us. And so that just shows you the value of poetry in, in other cultures, in Iraq, in China, in Russia. You know, poems can heal. Poems, poems are, are, are healing forces. A poem is a healing force. It's, it's, it's a force of compassion and peace and harmony. And, and this poem is called Celebration. I will approach the land by way of rivers. I will crawl over the naked earth. It's burning stones marrying my chest with their firearms. I will tell the birds to fly through my eyes, carrying my body high into the nude air of the sun. I will follow the long, good line of blood smelling of flowers into the center of the village of hearts. Bread we will eat together there. In the sky there will be signs. Swift, fresh wind will smash sweetly into our faces. Sun will form a fountain. Its water will be kernels of light who speak our hearts. From the four directions will come our friends. From all across this giant body of our circle in space, our earth, living planet of green and black, they will come. Song will begin. Song of the spheres of time. Song of the singing eyes. Song who bloods, whose blood knows the bent backs of every human being in every field and every land of earth, the bent backs of our food. Songs will commence whose only flag is truth. Speaking the language of trees and desert, we will sing the wind. We will sing the child. Free green blessings of life will offer warm hands into ours. Tents will appear as if out of nowhere, the somewhere of faith. These tents will be large and round, Bedouins of time. We, they, we. The furious pace of how we can run and run and run and run and run and run for years of life is not needed here. In its place, the blood sings. Its eye happy and full. The midwife silently arrives as a shadow of a bird. In one simultaneous moment, we human family rise, form a circle, and birth calls our name. Smile of eyes as we feel humanity's pulse, knowing our bones, our deepest feel, the destiny who connects us as a species. We will take from this moment a message. We will tell everyone, each one we find in our future, the message of this moment when deep and simple we understood that humanity has a chance to live its life as family neath the high-held sun, and time will extend its burning hand to kiss. Whew. Is that enough, or should I do more? Okay, I'll do another one. Okay. This is a poem dedicated um, to the great Spanish poet Miguel Hernandez that died in a, in a Spanish... Miguel Hernandez was a fantastic poet, and he, he died in a, in a Spanish prison camp. And, um, you know, he, he just... Uh, he shouldn't have died, he shouldn't have been in prison, but, you know, he... Uh, he was a great poet, and I love his poetry, and, you know, uh, I had to write this poem. You know, sometimes you just got to write poems, you know, the, the, the feelings come in, and you got to write the poem. Maybe it is priced precisely because I am from the middle class and didn't know hunger as a child that I have become to decry against it as a man. Maybe because of my city. Brooklyn streets, we didn't know river, that I have lived next 
to River and called him brother. Maybe it is precisely because the middle class is saturated in vapid complacency of have that I wanted more of truth of respect for what gave unto me what I possess, which may be explained why Miguel Hernandez's poem, when he was dying of tuberculosis in a Franco prison about his wife and children existing, holding on to the edge of life by eating only onions, onions, all they had. Maybe this is why I voraciously chew on an onion when I am out of food, and all that's left is an onion and some stale bread. Maybe this is why I keep screaming at the human race to love its mountains, rain, and sun, even though I have never climbed a mountain or been a farmer. I know how dear and precious rain and sun are, for my soul saw my father grounded to dust by capitalism, and I ate his fibers to become strong enough to develop a deep appreciation of all the wonder that naked life offers, simple and real, feeding my basic heart food, who is large and generous. Know how basic, how simple, the gold of the sun transformed in, into uh, that the phone is ringing. Where is the phone? Oh, oh. Hey, hold on. Yeah, hello. Hello? Hello? There's nobody there. <laughs> what should I do? Should I? Yeah, we better start over. Okay. Again, I'm talking about Miguel Hernandez, the, the great, great, great Spanish poet who died in a Franco prison camp of, tu of tuberculosis, you know. He was such a great poet, and he fought in a war against Franco, and very brave, very wonderful man, Miguel Hernandez, a great, great, great poet and a great human being. Maybe it is precisely because I am from the middle class and didn't know hunger as a child that I have become to decry against it as a man. Maybe because of my city, Brooklyn streets, we didn't know river, that I have lived next river and called him brother. Maybe it is precisely because the middle class is saturated in a vapid complacency of have that I wanted more of truth, of respect for what gave it to me, what I possessed, which may be explained why Miguel Hernandez's poem, when he was dying of tuberculosis in a Franco prison about his wife and children existing, holding on to the edge of life by eating only onions, onions, all they had. Maybe this is why I voraciously chew on an onion when I'm out of food. All that's left is an onion and some stale bread. Maybe this is why I keep screaming at the human race to love its mountains, rain, and sun, even though I have never climbed a mountain or been a farmer. I know how dear and precious rain and sun are for my soul. Saw my father ground into dust by capitalism, and I ate his fibers to become strong enough to develop a deep appreciation of all the wonder that naked life offers, simple and real, feeding my basic heart, food who is large and generous, no matter how basic or simple it is. The gold of the sun transformed into human fingers of creation who construct the world I am privileged to walk upon. So you see, I must keep on insisting, appreciate, appreciate, I keep demanding, respect your grandmother, your earth, don't take any particle of life for granted. Respect the miracle existence. Water it with your eyes. Feed it with your hands. Embrace it with your heart. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. And you know, life is a privilege, so keep that in mind and honor life with all your soul and give compassion to this earth and let's make this into a world of peace.
If you want to go outside, I can improvise one if you want. We are just about out. Oh, okay. Okay.